I don't know. We'll see how that did. I think I was, I think I was trying to do too, too many different things open at the same time on the computer here. So far, so good. How are you? <laughs> are you I'm, I'm here. Around the world. What's that? You've been traveling around the world. Are you worn out? Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, what, um, what I thought would happen did happen in that, uh, I'm getting my circadian rhythm is going to be off for a few days, hopefully not as long as last year. Um, woke up bolt that right upright. I had been up for almost 24 hours. Um, went to bed about 10, um, woke up at three 30 in the morning, wide awake. And, um, so I'm assuming that's the way it'll go for a few days. Oof. <laughs> three three thirty in the morning. So that was about what forty five minutes early for you. A couple hours, <laughs> hour and a half, two hours. <laughs> okay. And what did you what did you do with that extra time? Did you did you stay awake? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I found things to do. I had a bunch of things to do. I bought. Is there, do you feel like there's ever a time when you don't have a bunch of things to do? Nope. Never. Ever. I'm never bored. Ever. <laughs> well, sure. Yeah. How about you? How about you? Well, I have good news. All right. We got we got reader mail. Oh. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a readable podcast, but we still got reader mail. I'm gonna call it reader mail. Is this reader mail that will make my mother blush? There's there's one bad word in it. It it just starts with F me. I'm hooked. It's 5 a.m. and I'm listening to as Terry put it, two hacks in a basement. So that's good. And also, this was this was reader mail in response to ten questions, which we did a while back. Oh, and so yeah. the the ten que- <laughs> the reader mail uh, has answers to the ten questions as well. Oh, some so okay. So here 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 are the questions that our that our fan mail got on. This is from this is from Tim in Virginia. Uh, do you think that aliens have visited earth? Uh, I think you said, you said basically that you think maybe we are the aliens or maybe he said we are the aliens. And then he wrote the entire lyrics to Radiohead subterranean homesick (laughs) Homesick (laughs) in the email. Uh, and now, so we also have a, we have to respond with a follow up. He's got a question for us. The 11th question. Uh, do you think the earth is flat? Oh man. This is such a weird thing how, uh, you know, obviously I spent a fair amount of time in planes over the past 10 days and, um, no, I don't think the earth is flat, but I, what I thought about while flying over the sphere that is the earth and first off, how the hell would I know? How the hell would I know? I mean, I trust the 99.99, let's call it a hundred percent of credentialed scientists that have done, you know, going back a long time that have said the earth is round or a sphere. So I'm going with that. That's what I think, but I don't know personally. I mean, there's, there's curvature of the earth, that part you can observe for yourself. I think so. (laughs) So you've, you've been to multiple places on the earth. And when you look up at the moon and there's a shadow on the moon of the earth, it's a curved shape which wouldn't happen if it was a disc you've watched, you've watched a ship sail off to the end of the horizon. I've, I've seen it all. I, I know flight trajectories. I know satellites. I, I'm just saying all of those things. I trust that someone else's explanation. I don't personally know that. I feel like this is a case where the explanation itself is fairly easy to follow. I took, Let's just say yes, the Earth is a sphere. I don't think the Earth is flat. No, but there was a follow-up question from Reader Tim. But I want to, I want to say something about the, yeah. the the flat Earth people. What's it matter if it is or it isn't? Like, if you're right, if 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 diehard flat Earth person is correct, what's the prize? <laughs> i mean you'd be be right is there any better prize than that (laughs) is there any better prize than being correct (laughs) my position on this and it's it's like what what do you win 
You know, do, does somebody show up with a bag of cash? Do you never have to work again? I mean, like, what is the prize for being correct on the earth is flat? Because some of these people are like, it's a real thing. It's a real, like, it's a real position that has been staked out and whatever. This is, this is, uh, I don't think we want to take too Here's much Here's a follow-up question from reader Tim. All right. Would you be surprised to find out that the earth is flat? <laughs> <laughs> I want it to be like you, you want it to be flat and then you'd be like, wow, yeah, everything I, everything I knew has been turned on its head. Exactly. Exactly. Because that's the way most of this stuff works anyway. What's my favorite example of scientific consensus that goes horribly awry? Uh, you, I don't know what Newtonian physics. And where it's does not, it go? Where does it, it go awry? Well, it's not the it's not the total explanation. It it oh, turns yeah. out it's a very partial, um, a very partial sort of here and now physical explanation because it's missing all the quantum stuff. Yeah, and probably more um, if and again, I'm in no position to know if string theory has merit. Seems like no, um, but who who am I? But, uh, you know what though? I would be more surprised to find. I'd be more surprised to find that the earth is flat than I would be to find that God is real. Like any of the gods or okay. even all of the gods. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're, you're going white robe, white hair, beard on a chair in the sky. No, you're just no, not even just a definitive. If we could, I would be, I'd be more surprised to find a definitive way to, to measure that the earth is flat than if all of a sudden there was a definitive answer and we're like, no, clearly God is real. And I, I don't mean, I don't like, there's not really any faith to it. It's just, nope, God is real. And we now know every, everybody knows that everybody who doesn't believe in God is now a flat earther. Yeah. So you, you've left open too wide a semantical highway there for definition of God. I think God yeah, is it was sort of a cop out. Yeah. I think God is that we're not going there. <laughs> What else do we have? Read more from uh, our friend Tim. I like that was this. the that was the that was the bulk of it. There'll be okay. more. All right. We also recommended a Doors song I hadn't heard of for. Uh... Oh wait, no, hold on. That that was only the first of his two emails. There's a second one. He answered our question: If we could live in any fictional world, what fictional world would we want to live in? <laughs> his. I'm going to directly read his answer. He, he just wrote in the answer here. Well, certainly not this fictional world. It sucks. And whoever or whatever created it lacks imagination. Zero stars would not recommend. <laughs> I would have a tough time choosing between the Buffy verse from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Stars Hollow, uh, which is the universe of Gilmore Girls, and Sicily, the universe of Northern Exposure. And in his personal fictional world, Lima, Ohio was named after lima beans which are an abundant local crop and a significant source of income for the, for the region. Oh, I forgot about that. Lima, Peru, then obviously being named after Lima, Ohio. Named Ohio. Yes. Duh. So really the, the Lima bean is, um, a lot of different cities are trying to dim its sparkle. Yeah. I mean, this was, this was a real tome we got from Tim. It was a, it was a Tim tome. So maybe I'll come back to the Tim tome another time, but I want to, I had a I had a couple questions for you. Okay. And my I, it was a it's a long list, but I think my favorite question I had that's been eating away at me for a couple of days off that we've had here. I want to know how you feel about making music and why you make music. Ah oh, man, there's more layers to this, but I don't want to overload the question. Yeah. Well, I think the most concise way to answer that is at my core, I am a creator and a builder. And ter- I, I'm yeah. not, not assigning degrees of competency to that creation and building, um, but that's what I am. I am satisfied uh, unendingly by being a creator. So uh, music's been a huge part of my life. I've been a writer my whole life. And those two worlds merged uh, a long time ago. So, that. do you is most of your writing in songs now? I, 
I'll do an article here or there. Yeah. Um, technical stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's to, for better or for worse, writing to me has become um, an expression of art and an expression of thought in a creative sense. And to me, the the mechanics of writing a technical paper, I do not enjoy. Uh, once in a while, I, I do enjoy sort of going through that exercise to bring um, a different writing perspective to otherwise sort of rote, boring um, jargon that usually ends up in technical papers. And I know you, um, in spades are that person. You have that gift more than anyone that I've ever met. So anyway, that's why I, I don't, I don't really write anything else. I don't have a desire to, I think there are probably some books, probably short books, short form books, like not pretentious books, but there are some books, uh, that would make sense to write probably you and I to collaborate on. Um, I'm you know, slowly writing the biography of Terry Miller by way of podcasting it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a boring one. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, Did you ever make music for fame's sake? No. Yeah. Yes. Yes. How'd it, that go? It was very, very short lived. Um, early twenties, early, early twenties. Um, back when that paradigm was still viable, uh, still l- largely a, a, a winning the lottery, but the paradigm of hack it out a little bit locally, gen up a following regionally, some somebody takes notice, you get a record deal, and then you make some money. Um, you know, it's it's easier to be known Um, but also harder today. Anyway, early twenties, that's how I started. Um, and you know, just like every kid in their early twenties, you do something like that with the intention of having it be sort of the highest version of success of what you're doing. Um, and then the realization of what that looked like quickly set in and, uh, that was not a priority at all. And then coincidentally, there have been multiple times since then, even some recently, where um, the the opportunity to sort of go for it was there, and I didn't want to go for it. And in younger years, like around the time my son was born, we really had an opportunity to to do something. I'll just leave it at that. And uh, I blew it up. So yes, early 20s. Yes, um, it was a short lived phase. And I haven't been back to that since. Which part was the bigger, uh, I guess, turn off? Was it the was it the process of going from a little bit of local fame to to getting to another, another tier of fame? Was that, was it the process that it was going to take to get there? Or was it that the end goal of you pictured yourself, you know, world famous touring musician and you're like, I don't know if that's actually what I want. It's real simple. Um, I, I don't know what my personal traits are in terms of how they're received, but in, in terms of what I want to be internally, I just relentlessly want to be authentic, relentlessly. There is nothing I I, I want to be empathetic, you know, uh, all of the things that I think we all conceptually share, but I genuinely want to be authentic. I want to be who I am. And I don't care who you are. If you want to be famous in anything, you have to be inauthentic to some degree. You have to do things you don't want to do. And I, I can't do that. I can't like, even today I can't, I can't sit and I can't do enough social media content for the band to get it off the ground, to get it out there, to, to make it known. I can't do it. Like there it's so much of that. Now, if there's a way that, I find that is more organic and authentic and 
you know, if we were playing shows every day, that would be a different story or have, you know, there, there are ways to do it, I'm sure. But as it stands today, I, I can't do that. So, um, I think my authenticity is the limiting factor or my desire to be authentic is the, the limiting factor. How much of a rush do you get from playing a show? Love it. There's nothing like it, but it's not, you do, you do get, um, you do get an, a feedback from the energy of the people that are there. Uh, there's a, there's a definite, um, that's a definite thing, but, the real thing, and it, it, this has happened when there were like 10 people there, is when the people who are playing the songs are 100% locked in together and you're in a, you're all in the same trance together and you just blow through an hour of music. Mm -hmm. There is nothing like that. Nothing like that. It is, and I've played sports, I've done a lot of things. There is nothing like, uh, and it doesn't happen every time. In fact, most of the time, it's a um, it's a grind. Somebody can't hear. Mm -hmm. Things are cutting out. You're, you're dealing with physical systems that are fragile, so it's it's hard to to get that a lot. Um, but there have been a handful of. And I'd say 10 to 15 in all the years I've been doing this where that has happened, it's it's unexplainable. I think a lot of the people that stick with the rock tar, rock star lifestyle, which I'm, I'm that, that's a bit of an anachronism at this point, but I'm still going to call it the rock star lifestyle. <laughs> I think if you are getting a huge thrill from playing, you know, like a successful club show uh, and then you go, you know. And maybe you get to play like a small arena and then, you know, eventually you're playing stadium shows. I feel like if, if you're if you're really thriving on that sort of performance, all of the build up to it and then all of the all of the let me get the next bigger thing is more or less the number one thing in your life. You basically are like, I there's no audience big enough for me to play on to play in front of. There's no tour big enough. There's no show big enough. I don't care how big it is. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. I want the Super Bowl halftime show, but times infinity. And I want to do that every night. And if I die out there, great. That's exactly what, that's how I want to go out. What you're explaining and you're hundred percent correct. And this is why I've joked before it, here on happy job about, you know, I'll miss that. We'll never get shy rock star, you know, like the, the, the <laughs> Eddie Vedder MTV unplugged version where he's, you know, they're intense and mysterious. Yeah. Um, they're still ego driven savages. Everybody who does that to go out and do it, it's a function of ego. Like you want to be seen. Otherwise, you would right. just stay in your basement and make yeah. records. It is a function of ego. And so I think that's um, if I had a bone to pick with the arts community, it would be stop, stop, you know, come, come down off the pedestal. Um, when you criticize, there are lots of criticisms for business type people, but um, with the ego criticism, because arts have every bit the ego of any other sort of group. And uh, I know that firsthand. Pearl Jam. Which, if you know, for our younger audiences, this was a band from Seattle from the '90s. They played they played really long sets deep into the into the 2000s, and so uh, you'd go to a Pearl Jam show and you'd get three hours, three and a half hours, four hours, two, three, maybe four sets. They played two encores that were longer than the show, and. Uh, you know, you know, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of drunken Eddie Vedder, who's the the front man. So he, by the by the mid two thousands, he played a lot of shows, and you know he was he was partying, right? Like he was doing this because he loved it, because he couldn't stop, because he lived for the the applause. To quote Lady Gaga, and I don't think it made the shows any worse, but I don't think that that can last forever either. Because every every young thriving rock star looks at old or aging rock stars and is like, oh, I don't want to be that. <laughs> and and like, what's the path, right? Like, what's the avenue to get there? So, 
you know, playing music for your fan base. But if, if your fan base was everybody who's cool, but now everybody who's cool is getting old and lame, just like you are, it's very difficult to keep that going. And then you have, then you have a, a totally different direction. Uh, you know, rock, rock and roll might be dead, but the spirit of rock and roll certainly is living on. Do you know, imagine dragons? They're very famous. They had a song about it was radioactive was their biggest hit. You know, this song, nothing. I think so. I think so. All right. So these guys are huge, but they're not that young. They're in their mid thirties, maybe, but their fan base is everything from elementary school kids to people their age and older because they have, you know, big bombastic, uh, anthem anthems, electro rock, I would call it. So there's like a lot of, there's a lot of rock and roll to it, but it's very, very highly produced. And there's a lot of electronic elements to it as well. Um, but it's, it's very, appealing to a wide group, a lot of emotion. Uh, and I don't know what my point was here other than to say it's easier to picture a band that's got that sort of wide appeal, just like they're just going to rock and roll forever and nobody's going to care that they're getting old or that they're getting, you know, like their, their fan base is getting lame or that they're, they're like playing cruise ships now. And I'm not sure the band is going to care either. Like when I was in my twenties, it was laughable to think about how old the Rolling Stones were and still playing. That was 15 plus years ago and they're still playing and still touring and still selling out stadium shows for huge amounts of money for their tickets. I don't know what's motivating these guys. But think about it. They are the penultimate lucky of the lucky. There are like five bands, 10, 15 artists maybe in the history of this thing that get to keep doing their version of what they were doing and not play in state fairs and cruises and casinos to make a living. Right. And even, in, even if you get to the, you know, I'm not, so I'm, a, I'm now old and wise enough that I actually don't feel comfortable mocking aging rock stars. Oh, I do. And I have, because, a, because I have more in common with an aging rock star than with, a, <laughs> than with an up and coming rock star. But and I'm, I don't want to name, I don't want to name bands because I feel like it's unfair and they've already got piled on. But if you go one <laughs> tier below the top tier, and when I say top tier, like the, this, this is going to be a laundry list of bands Terry doesn't listen to. <laughs> right. But in, in the rock and roll world, it's, you know, Imagine Dragons is a good example. Uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, Foo Fighters, these are bands that have been doing the same thing for decades and still sell tons of tickets. Uh, if you go one tier down in terms of prestige, in terms of sales, in terms of how long they've been doing it, it's a totally different world. And the the smacks of desperation versus the these people are just still clearly loving every second of this is pretty wild. So I like the duality of that. You frame that well. I like the duality of that group because I think two things are true. Yes, it's embarrassing. um, Because it's only only embarrassing if you're embarrassed by it. (laughs) Well, it's 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 like it's easy to it's this the same thing as um, you know actors or actresses Mm. taking really crap gigs, yeah, bad roles, yeah, but. The, the duality is there's that, but then there's also they're getting paid. You know, it's a check. Now, the question exists, um, what would you, in fact, do for money? Um, but this whole thing brings up, uh, you know, duality and aging rock star. I love the juxtapos- juxtaposition. And I think of lead guitarists for some reason, because they're the bad boys of the band. The You know, the, they're the, the they're definitely the, the divas. Yeah, they're they're the, they're the, they're the, you know, obviously the, the front man, the ladies want the, you know, is the focal point. Um, but the lead guitarist has the edge and, and all that, you know, they're mysterious and, and all of the sort of things that we attach to rock stardom. Most of that is carried by the lead guitarist. Correct. I love the juxtaposition of that guy, mostly guy in his early twenties versus that guy in his fifties or late forties. Because the guy in his late 40s or 50s 
is a train wreck. Um, like dork, not cool, no skills, <laughs> you know, no, no discernible skills, except I, you know, his resume is I could shred in my twenties. You know, that's the resume. Generally and, speaking, they're up their own. They're very up their own ass about, about their skill set. But they still try to dress like, you know, I don't know. I love that juxtaposition. And and there are scales of that. Like there are people, um, you know, Richie Sambora, maybe he's a little off the rails as an example, but there, there are that scale. Then there's also the local music scale. I was about and, to say, there's a guy in your town who is that guy. I know a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. I know a lot of them. Yeah. And, um, and, and there's the, you know, that version that I just described, there's also the artistic version that I just described, you know, played, um, lead guitar and they're the same person. That's the point that I want to make. Like, you know, Van Halen or Bon Jovi or hairband lead guitarist and navel gazer, you know, math rock lead guitarist. They are the same person. I'm sorry. They may have different artistic sensibilities, but mm-hmm. they are the same person. And same thing with lead singers, you know, or front people. Doesn't matter the band genre, they're the same person. And uh, I, I just love that, that juxtaposition of how things, those characteristics that we find so endearing in artists, musicians, rock stars in their early 20s, those things don't age well. They don't translate well to f- late 40s, early 50s. They just yeah, it's kind of it's kind of it's sort of uh, the word I want to say is unfair. <laughs> but but I, I mean, I think most people know what they're getting into if they sign up for that life or they mm. they could know what they, they were getting into. But the beneficiary of the rock star lifestyle is all of the, the screaming fans who are, you know, they're able to like, like you go to a show, you're a screaming fanatic and you, you like, you hang it up and go back to your life, right? Yeah. Like that's the beneficiary. The beneficiary is the, the, the caricature of the super person that we, that we put up there as, you know, oh, that could be me or look at how amazing this person is. And <laughs> you know, it chews them up and spits them out. Yeah. Well, I think there is an element of, it takes a unique mindset to have enough comfort to walk on a stage in front of five people yeah. and perform. Right. And, and especially as a writer, um, to say, here is the stuff that I have written and this gang of misfits is going right. to perform it mm-hmm. and you're going to judge it. Yeah. You have to, that takes a special person. So I think as a fan, you understand going into this contractual agreement I don't have the juice to do that. So that's why that relationship right. has yeah, the exactly. dynamic that it has. Yeah. Um, and then the more flamboyant, the more elaborate, the more, you know, the more performant that a person is, I think the more people recognize, oh, this is a, it, it's, it's really, it's our brain's ability to spot um, outliers and, right. The the ultimate rock star performer, the Mick Jagger, like Mick Jagger, we we would not survive as a species if we were all Mick Jaggers. <laughs> I don't, no, I I think you're right. So I think I think our brains are you know hardwired to um, you know spot that and are drawn to it, and it's not even so much as a oh that's the that's the greatest thing for the you know it's the best thing ever, but just I don't I can't do that. I, I, don't, watched Michael, I watched Michael Jordan play basketball one time at a game. Exactly. Live. It was nothing like any other basketball game. It was not, nothing like it. And he, he was quite over the hill by this time. And it changed my entire perspective about basketball in a couple different ways. And it, I mean, I'm just glad I got to see it. And I feel like there are certain shows where I would want to go to see certain acts that you know, there's nothing else quite like it. And I, I'd be glad to get a chance to see it while I could. I also don't pursue those. Um, generally <laughs> speaking, a lot, of, a lot of those artists have, uh, over the last 10 years or so started playing mostly festival shows and mm. festival gigs. And, and I don't have any interest in the music festival scene, uh, because it's a lot of work and yeah. a lot of, a lot of time commitment, a lot of dollar commitment, and just generally not the kind of show I would want to see. 
so then so then you have to like watch for the the side projects where you get to see the guy or the the act that you want to see but they're not it's not their main thing where they're only playing you know 10 festival shows over the summer so the night after you and my brother and i um saw lightning bolt in dc he and i went to see patterson hood uh, who's the front man for he's the writer of all of drive by trucker stuff mm-hmm. and we saw him at city winery so it was an intimate acoustic um and admittedly like i like this style of music but they never resonated with me drive by truckers yeah. never resonated with me uh but that's the type of thing that i enjoy seeing now is okay i get the the sort of thing that you've done what's like the closer i can get to how they sort of do it in their bedroom or in their office or, you know, wherever they write music, the closer I can get to that, to see how that process works for them. That's what I enjoy more of now. Well, that's, that's, so there's two, well, probably more than two, but there's at least two types of, of aging music fans as well. There's the aging music fans who want to hear some hits and bop along, which is fine. Like go to a blues bar. And there's the, there's the aging music fans who are, watching and thinking in terms of what's happening, not just what they're hearing. And, you know, it's the same as watching baseball as you learn about strategy and you, you learn about um, the ins and outs of the, the game that you don't necessarily see on the field being played. But the same thing when you go and, and watch a show. So thinking about how the production was created, thinking about, you know, a lot of, a lot of times is manifested as laundry listing personnel so somebody that's followed a band for a long time will be like, oh, well, so-and-so used to be the drummer and then they played for this other guy and this and, this, and then now they're with that guy, but then he died and now they've brought in <laughs> so-and-so who used to play with such and such. And I'm like, I find that so tedious. Yeah. But it's, that is, it's not for me, the person listening to that. It's for the person that's like cataloging this is what happened to the band and this is how the sausage got made and this is the, you know, the stuff that's behind behind the music or behind the show that's actually being that's actually being played as opposed to just here are notes that I like going in my ears this was a good or a bad show tonight and so engaging with more of the process and more of the meaning and more of the people making it makes it easy to continue to care about music even even as sort of like your taste either broaden or get more narrow and you only like what you like it just gives you another level to be sort of feeling like you're participating or feeling like you know what's going on in the music and th- and that engaging with that is also it's the other way for aging rock stars so every aging rock star that kind of thrives after their big career they find a, they find the next way and overwhelmingly the next way is engaging with the music on a, on a different level so whether that's uh, having an instagram account where you're breaking down you know, popular riffs and covers of your own song, or whether that's a YouTube channel where you're talking, you know, you're talking about production or whether it's a, you know, you turn like Eddie Vedder did a, an album, a solo album of ukulele songs. And at this point, even that album is old, but you know, like he's doing that because he's like, can I write songs that are just me and a ukulele and make that an album? And then what would happen? I mean, it's like, that's not for a mainstream Pearl Jam fan. It's for somebody who's either going to give it a couple listens here or there, or it's for a random ukulele music fan. And really the person it's for is for Eddie Vedder. <laughs> like, that's the, ba- the person it's, it's for. It's for the bank account. Uh, not ukulele songs. No, but he can go play club shows by himself off that record and get people to come out and see it. I don't think, I don't even think he tore it off of it. I think I think this was a this was a I want to make a ukulele songs album so I did. Am I am I yelling? I, I you know I had a I got a nasty sinus infection. Um, you sound a little nasal. I, I yeah nasty sinus infection, um, which presented some problems. But um, I I can't hear a whole lot. And you sound I, great. I, I'm not screaming. No. <laughs> okay. No, I'll let you know. You asked me a question. Um, or you, we've we've been sort of all over this issue. I want to explain um, to you, for me today at this age, 
what I find so satisfying about this, and and I'll explain it. So, I was just in London doing uh, an EP with a label over there, and um, it was the best musical experience of my life, hands down. And it's the, the it's a pair of Finnish brothers um, that were a touring rock band in, in the nineties. They like, they played with at the drive in and some people like that, but, um, they're, uh, incredibly smart, amazing personalities, funny. And the engineer is the younger brother. His name's Matt. And so I was holed up in a studio with him for the better part of four full days. And, it was an absolute blast. So this is this is what um, sort of this was the cherry on top of the whole thing. I wrote this song um, and I wrote it on piano and just put a little acoustic piece to it just to because I'm a guitar band guy mm -hmm. and that's changing a little bit. But anyway. So I, I, I sent them the songs, uh, four track versions of the songs early. So he, we weren't, we weren't even going to do this one, but I was like, uh, you know, this has been fun. Let's, let's do it. So he sits down at the piano, um, and he's like, let's just play through this song. And we're in the studio in, in the engineering room. And he's like two feet away from me. I'm sitting on a stool on an acoustic guitar. He's on a piano and he starts playing this version of this thing that I wrote on the piano. That's like beautiful and haunting. And it's, it's hard to explain. We do like 20 minutes of, we do, we, we go through that song a couple of times. He records the piano part. I overdub a bunch of guitar parts. I go cut the vocal track. He starts layering in a bunch of pads and stuff underneath it. And I don't care what anybody else thinks, but like for me, in terms of the stuff that I've written, it it's the best vocal performance I've ever had. But it's the, it like, I don't think anything that I've ever written has captured maybe another tune or two has ever been captured the way that that has been captured. And it's just that process of here is another person on something that was an idea that sits down and also contributes to that idea. And that idea comes out way better um, than anything I could have done by myself. And that whole process is, again, like the, the playing live and you're all in the same zone. That's the process of creating that collaborative piece that's hard to, it's hard to replicate in any other thing in life. How boring was that story? It wasn't boring. But when I was in my 20s, I heard, even, or even before that, so I, I got, as a music listener, I got really into music starting in high school probably. And the, the studio stories, they were all like, they were, you know, I told, I, I talked about how personnel stories feel tedious. Well, okay. I feel the same way about studio stories. I feel the same way about where did the guitar come from stories? Like, I don't care about the guitars in your collection. I just yeah. want to hear some rock and roll. Yeah. And, you know, it's become number one, it's less boring. The more of these stories I've heard. Uh, and number two, it's, it, I spent a lot of time wondering why it felt so boring then. And I think it was just cause I was trying to find, like, I was just looking for another good song. And well, so I, I, you know, like this was the freaking radio days, right? So this was a time when, you know, most of what I heard was FM radio CDs that were widely available. It would be, you know, when I got access to things like the, the music college uh library of of all their catalog that was like the world was my oyster because they have you know they have five thousand albums holy cow i can't believe i have five thousand albums i can just go and you know check out and sit there and listen to like i couldn't even take them home but i could sit there and listen to five thousand albums and a lot of it was stuff i'd never heard you know you you learn about 
what to listen to next from from your own older brother i didn't have one or somebody else's older brother or the guy i got you know i rode to school with he had a, a case of cds and i'd be like okay well i've never listened to outcast i guess i'm going to take these outcast cds and see how this is and to go from from that where you're just trying to fill up your your mind with the experience of having heard a lot of different music and every time you get something that's new and good it's giving you a thrill you know that that like tapers off as you figure out your tastes and as you get more exposure to more music i have read that there's a physiological component to this where the most compelling music that you'll ever hear is the music you heard when you were young and the reason that people's tastes tend to become less eclectic as they age is like nothing clicks the same way as, you know, those big ones, the big high school bangers that you'll remember forever. <laughs> so I'm curious about that because I absolutely have become more eclectic with age. Like I, in fact, that's what I look for in music is I want to hear something different. Well, so I, I'd, I'd put it, I'd, I'd split that up a little bit, right? So you're, your listening habits become more eclectic, but the stuff that resonates with you the most always comes back to stuff that sounds like whatever that stuff you were listening to when you were young. So if, if you know, you, I listen to a much, much, much wider swath of music now than I did before. And it's not just because it's, it's readily available thanks to the power of the internet. It's also because I'm basically thrill seeking. I'm like, find me the next thing that i can that, that, that can be new but still familiar something like i want to get that you know i want to feel like an imagine dragons anthem again give me the know? dopamine hit right exactly yeah and, and and that's hard to do from brand new unfamiliar music whether it's unfamiliar because you're dipping into world music territory or it's unfamiliar because you know lady gaga is doing things with music that they didn't do when we were kids or because uh, Lady Gaga is a terrible example. Doja Cat is writing lyrics that just don't resonate because they're not poetic. You know, all this <laughs> stuff is uh, the, but it, it's all closely tied to how the aging rock star avoids becoming a cliched stereotype and basically just a wrinkly old fart. <laughs> you know it's like engage <laughs> with the rest of it. Elvis Costello is great about this. I, I don't love, listen, I, love him. I don't listen. I don't listen to Elvis Costello music, but I like listening to Elvis Costello talk about making music. He get you know he'll he'll have you know as he gets interviewed by the music press. Like unlike unlike regular press, you can just be a fan of whoever you're interviewing, and you can just sort of fawn over them. And he you know not every interview, but routinely he'll be like, I mean, I'm glad that you like this, but the reason it's good is because we put an enormous amount of work into it. And it took a ton of dedication over a lot of years. And that's why the album is good. And I'm proud of it because it was a huge labor of love. And I'm glad that you like it. But, you know, this stuff doesn't come out because I'm a genius. It comes out because discipline like, we did the stuff to make an album that was good. Right. How did he avoid being canceled? That's my first question. Did he do something cancel worthy? Dude, have you heard? Have you read the lyrics to Oliver's Army? That's no, a I don't listen to any of his music or read any of his lyrics. I just know that he's a <laughs> he's a name that gets dropped by music fans, and his jazzy or duetty type stuff is like three steps away from music I would I would listen to for the most part. Well, go listen to Oliver's Army because it is a classic, awesome record. Awesome record. But also, isn't is aren't you but, allowed to aren't you allowed to have terrible things, say horrible things if they're lyrics? It's when well, you say them and they're not lyrics that you get canceled. I mean Doji Cat would be canceled if if not. I don't care. I don't I'm bored with that. Like the we could we could get real current eventy with that topic and I don't care about it. Here's my question for you. <coughs> And I'll give you my answer first. And Please. then I want to, I want to, I want to ask you, I have cried the first time and not like sobbed, but a, a song has moved me to tears. The first time I heard the song, has that ever happened to you? Uh, you're, you're very, yes. okay. Yeah. But, it, but it was like barely a song. It was, a, I, the song is called real death. I don't even know who it's by. And this dude's uh, wife died of cancer. They had a young kid. He wrote a song. He wrote an album about it. And I heard the song. I was like, that's too much. Can't do it. 
Yeah, that's like real literal. Damn. Well, he just he just did a very good job of capturing yeah. what happens when somebody dies and, and not like not not the not the stuff about, you know, I'll the miss light. your soul forever <laughs> and your light is being extinguished. It was not a him. It was like <laughs> and then we had to have an ambulance come to the house and take your dead body away type of stuff, which was a lot. Like that was really tough. Yeah. Uh there was also a song that made me cry. This is with the benefit of hindsight, this story is almost funny. The other song that made me cry for exactly the same reason, this LCD sound system song, um, Someone Great, you know the song? Yeah. Yeah. So I, like the, I, I love that band, by the way. Great band, great song. Yeah. Uh, highly likely cancellation target right there. Um, and so Someone Great is just, it's just unclear enough whether it's a breakup song or a dead person yeah. song. Yeah, that I just, you know, I took it at face value and I read it as as a death song. Uh, it's a loss. It's a song of loss. Yes. Yeah, so, so it's a song of loss and it's well written because it can be universally applied to loss and it was very affecting. And I like I would have to skip it because I get emotional and the type of lyrics in the song that really connected me with. Me, and we, you know how I feel about lyrics. So the fact that this got me is 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 big. Uh, but like. This, the, whatever the line is about the how it's the weather is nice but it should be raining because you're because you feel like you have a sense of loss that really connected with me yeah um because that part was very griefy and very realistic so that song made me very emotional and then because i'm an idiot i went to read more about what the song was actually about and it became it became clear with not a lot of extracurricular reading that it was not a song about someone dying <laughs> drugs about, no it's a song about breaking up with somebody yeah well, that makes which sense. which you know like i the song should be able to stand on its own merits but the emotional punch of knowing that it was written about a breakup was as, as opposed to a dead person that definitely took a little bit of the sting out of it for me so i can listen to it now and i don't get worked up it's a good song too so that helps yeah do you know what I experienced long before crying about a song though? Adrenaline. Oh, I didn't yeah. even know. I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. I remember like I'd be sitting in the car, classic rock station roundabout would come on that like bass solo -y part in the, in the beginning. And I'm like, yeah, this is great. I got these shivers all over my body. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, 15 years later, I was like, oh yeah, the shivers that's, that's adrenaline. That's what that is. There are like, four or five songs off of um evil empire i think is the name of the record rage against the machine yeah. that to this day when those come on i'm like eh, maybe we should go you know break something or run through a wall like i it was, really enjoy it was it. helpful to connect adrenaline and triggers for adrenaline because then I also was able to basically sort of diffuse it, use that. Well, yeah, well, no, I never learned how to do that. Um, <laughs> but it was useful for things like I'm nearly at the finish line of a running race. And now I'm like, and knowing, okay, if I, if I get a shot of adrenaline now and it's too early, <laughs> this is going to be bad. And if no. I get it just right, I'll be able to finish strong and feel good about how the rest of the whole thing went. So that was kind of cool. My cry song. Um, at least the one that I can remember is uh, it's off of Sunvolt's second album. I think the name of the album is Straightaways. Yeah. And there's a song called Left a Slide. And there's this like super haunting steel guitar part at the end and this like big chorus and this harmony that they drag out that's like so lonesome mm -hmm. and sad. And I don't even know what the lyrics are about. I don't care. But whatever came together at that moment was very haunting. And, um, so I, and it's weird because my brother and I sort of connected notes, um, or compared notes about hearing that's back when you got an album, when it first yeah. came out and, you know, a couple of weeks after it came out, we compared notes about our first listen. I was like, he was like, man, I was sitting in my car on break, um, for whatever job he was working. And he's like, just, you know, crocodile <laughs> from the tears. same song <laughs> from the same song wow. the same spot it's crazy I, anyway. it's it's also it's sort of wild <sighs> i you know i don't listen to lyrics closely for the most part but i've never cried over an instrumental song 
I can tell you that definitively. Or or never no. an instrumental song, never an instrumental section. Like I only cry about the subject matter of the words, which may be very deeply uh, emphasized by the music, but it's not the music part by itself that's making me cry. It's got to be the words. I would. I also want to add. Ever since my kids were born, I'll cry about anything. Like every movie, books, I'll cry over anything. <laughs> oh, that surprises me because you have um, what feels like a very Brahmin exterior, like a very East Coast Brahmin exterior. Um, but Charlotte's I'm, Web, oh, killing me. I could barely, I couldn't make it. I'm like think, reading it. I'm reading aloud to both kids, and I'm like, oh my god, the whole last three chapters of that book. There it is. So. There's a song, um, and, and it's not crying, but there's a song that you should check out. It, there's a local band here from Louisville that would have been huge, um, but the lead singer uh, passed away of cancer. This was a number of years ago. The band's name is Shipping News, and they have a song called Axons and Dendrites. You just have to listen to this song and sit with the vibe that the song gives you it's unlike anything i've ever experienced it's not sadness um it's not it, it i can't explain it check it out check it out i'll check it out uh i'm gonna wrap up with the last new album aging rock star not rock star he's an aging rapper t-pain no, we covered his on top of the covers <laughs> album, which, well, okay. I mean, I'll quickly revisit T Pain. So T Pain, as he ages, he all like my whole point about all of the aging rock star thing is: what are you chasing? What are you seeking? What are you What are you trying to find fulfillment from? And T Pain, massive success, but got trashed by a bunch of people for using auto tune on all his records. Spends. 10 plus years seeking validation that he is a legitimate artist and he's not a gimmick auto tune artist. He goes on one of the singing shows, whatever the anonymous one where, where you don't know it's T pain until he wins the contest. And then he's like, take that haters. I won this show with real singing, not with, not with auto tune. Uh, he does like this, no auto tune, uh, version of the tiny desk concert, which kind of blows up. I guess this whole I'm a real singer thing culminating in a very unexpected cover album that came out beginning of this year, early last year or end of last year um, with non R and B covers all over it with him singing. Fine. Okay. T-Pain has sought validation as a real artist. Uh, the next one I want to bring up Andre 3000, half of outcast put out an album came out this week, I think. And it is mostly him playing a variety of flutes. There's no rapping at all. I don't even think there's really a rhythm section in most of the album. And the title of the first song is <laughs> like all the song names are basically either apologetic or, or really, really, really weird. My and yeah, go ahead. Sorry. My friend sent me a quote of his, I think from that record where he says something to the effect of you all don't need a rap album from me. You need healing, <laughs> which I, uh, I think is pretty good. Right. So the name of this, the <laughs> full name of this song is actually too long to fit anywhere. It's, I swear I, this is the first, the first song off of his new album. I swear I really wanted to make a rap album, but this is literally the way the wind blew me this time. It's been 15 years. Here's an album from 103,000. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think that guy's seeking. I think that guy's finding. And that's if, if this whole artistic expression thing is done correctly, that's the way it should go. That's exactly the way it should go. And coincidentally, you lose fans of one type and hopefully gain fans of another type. Um, but there is a sacrifice of popularity if that's the case. I think Andre is okay with that. Until he'll probably want to, you know, when the decision's made to, uh, when, when an artist is faced with the decision of, okay, I need to go get a nine to five or I can make that record, that record, you know, the, the one that I made already, but 
I know how it will go financially. That's the decision I think a lot of those people have to make is, you know, do I want to go do the nine to five or do I want to give them what they want? <clears throat> I, you know, for whatever reason, I never thought about music that way. I think about acting that way, but I, I've never really, music's never the really same put thing two together. It's the same thing. And I think it's I, because I'm so dismissive of what the paycheck album looks like or what the paycheck tour looks like because I just associate it with the paycheck is the, the cruise ship residency. <laughs> yeah, but you have other options in life. And if you've gotten to a certain point, probably in your 30s or 40s, and your only discernible skill is I had some songs on the radio or, you know, we were kind of successful and you lived a certain lifestyle that sucked up a lot of that, you know, 30 year ago label money. You don't have a lot. Like if your only skill is what you've developed in, in the, in the art world, you have to make some real choices about what you want to do. You have other options. So you can say, I don't want to, I'm not doing the state fair or the cruise ship circuit. Like I'm not going out like that. That's your prism today. But you know, 30 year old, what's, I think, I think of the guy, the, the guitar player from Limp Biscuit that like wore a clown mask and West Borland. Yeah. Like that guy's options. I don't know how f- much money they made or anything, but that guy's options probably not broad. You I'm know, actually, I'm going to dig into that one. That's a, that's a great example. Yeah. My, uh, my now, con- he's, he's an investment banker or some shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my confirmation advisor was somewhat friends with their family prior to moving to where I was confirmed. Interesting. Weird, weird connection. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna take us out, Terry. Take it out. Let's, let's talk about how you pay for your second career as a rock star next time. <laughs> Is that actually too, too much? That might be too much. I think, I think we're done with this. Yeah. Bye, I think we <laughs> have a good one. See you later.